My name is George Jackson, and I will be your facilitator for the Sunday School lesson today. Today's lesson is entitled, Call to Heal. Our lesson is found in Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Key verse, whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thou sin be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. Our lesson aim, study Mark's account of Jesus healing and the man who is paralyzed. Second, appreciate how one's physical, emotional, social, and spiritual need are intertwined. Lastly, pray for God's healing grace to touch us at our particular point of need. Now, I've outlined, you can see on the board, number one, Jesus preaches. That's found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Second, Jesus parted, verses 5 through 9. And lastly, Jesus healed. That's, those are verses 10 through 12. Let's look at the introduction. In October 2018, the owners of a popular Denver restaurant announced it would be closing at the end of the year. White Fence Arm had served family-style fried chicken dinners for 45 years. The gift shop, the barn, with live music, children's slide, and a petting zoo, in addition to Good Foods had made White Fence Farm more than a restaurant. It was a place to create wonderful memories. My siblings and I have a tra tradition of taking each other out to eat on our birthdays. As soon as I heard the news, I announced I wanted to go to White Farm since my birthday was approaching. Although the restaurant had stopped taking reservations, we were told that since we were coming on Thursday, that we should be okay as long as we were there by 5.30. Well, when we arrived, we discovered a two and a half hour wait. So we decided to go elsewhere. The following Thursday, my brother-in-law called and asked if I was game to try again. This time we got there just before the restaurant opened at 4.30. I groaned. The line leading to the door was about 50 yards long. When we got inside, we were told that the wait might be two hours. Not wanting to leave with an empty stomach again, I persuaded the others to stay. Thanks to the hostess, cautious estimate, and two sweet ladies, who were happy to include us in their party. It wasn't long before I was savoring all the chicken, the sides, and fritters I could eat. Listen, today's lesson considers an occasion when a crowd of people wanted to go into a house where Jesus was. The vineyard was so popular that one could even get near the door. For those who faithfully persisted, the reward was much better than a fried chicken dinner. Lesson content. The Gospel of Mark is a book of action. After an introduction of only three verses, the record began with John did baptize and preach. Continued to be on the move. Jesus continued to be on the move, while the other three guys will often slow down the action. Mark moves right along with the condensed style. Mark 2, verses 1 through 12, today's text, is parallel to quite similar accounts in Matthew 9, 1 through 
8. And Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. Although the chronological order of events varies in the three synopsis gospels, all three locate the scene in Capernaum during Jesus' initial ministry in Galilee. According to the passage just prior, a man with leprosy had come to Jesus and pled with him to be made clean. Jesus healed the man but told him not to tell others about it. Jesus may not have wanted to ignite the popular but erroneous hope that a miracle working Messiah had come to deliver Jews from Roman oppression. But the man began to publish it much, insomuch that Jesus could not could no more openly enter into the city. And they came to him from every quarter. That shot wave continued into today's passage. Let's look at the verses. True or false? Friends who will sacrifice themselves on our behalf are precious. Of course that's true. Verse 1 says, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise as he was in the house. The main thing, coming to Capernaum. Although Jesus saw, or although, although Jesus grew up in a small town of Nazareth in Galilee, he had made Capernaum his base of operation when he began his public ministry in that region. Capernaum was a town northwest south, northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had frequent interaction there. As news spread of Jesus' presence in Capernaum, he was likely at the house of Simon and the brother of Andrew. Simon's brother-in-law had been healed there and was happy to offer Jesus hospitality. Many female disciples supported Jesus in his ministry through funds and hospitality. Simon, mother-in-law, was probably one of these women. Although there is no indication that she left the penum, her daughter, Simon Peter's wife, did. Verse 2 says, And straightway, meaning right away, many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Main theme, capacity crowd. Partially as a consequence of a healed man spreading the news about Jesus, there was no room in or even near the house where Jesus was. The house was probably a rectangular one-story building surrounded by a large walled courtyard. The site where archaeologists believe Peter House had been is about 28 feet long. Evidently, the door was left open so that others could at least cram close to it and hear what was being said. Those who could do so listened to Jesus preach the word, that is, the good news, regarding the impending kingdom of God and the necessity of repentance by faith. Listen to this. It's called Standing Room Only. Many years ago, a young congregation was looking for ways to raise community awareness of their small church. One of the elders, a strong willed mind, willed man, was convinced that a certain tent revival preacher could achieve this. So that man was called to do so. An evangelist, an evangelist crusade. The evangelist was known for somewhat a circus like atmosphere that permeated the services held inside the big tent. The meeting got off to a small start, with about 90% of the seats empty. Undeterred, revivalists went on local media the following day to report 
capacity crowds. Does that remind us of anything? Even though the meeting continued for two weeks, there were never any standing room only crowds. It took the church several years to recover from the embarrassment. No. There was no need for false reports to get a crowd around Jesus. What happened when Jesus came to town was more spectacular, spectacular than anyone imagined. Moving on, verse 3 says, And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Main theme, extraordinary interest. Question, when is the last time you made an extraordinary interest for something of importance? Moving on, meanwhile, Four men carrying a fifth man approached the back the packed house. True or false? The only thing we know for sure about this man who was sick with the palsy is that he was unable to walk. That's true. He may not even have had use of his arms. His condition could have been from birth or as the result of a man of an accident, a stroke, etc. The determination of the man's friend to bring him to Jesus suggests that he was in dire strait, and those four believe Jesus could help. No. While it is important to keep our attention on Christ, we must also not forget others who are seeking Christ. Verse 4 says, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the pilot lay. No, the action of breaking a hole in the roof isn't a destructive, isn't as destructive as it seems. Houses in Israel in Jesus' day generally had a flat roof that was accessible by a ladder or stairwell. The wooden cross beams were overlaid with reeds and branches and big mud or clay. This stacked material had to be pre-packed with a stone roller every fall before the winter rain. So, so it wouldn't have so it wouldn't have been difficult for the four men to dig through the stacks and their deconstruction could be repaired with relative ease. Even so, imagine the drama of the scene. People in the house below are being sprinkled with debris. They are startled and confused. Then light begins to filter in as the hole becomes bigger. Then the light is bottled out by something being lowered through the hole. Not just something, a man on a bed where there was no room before. Certainly, the crowd jostled and divided to make room for this newcomer. Likely, if you step forward to help with the Lauren, once they realize what is happening. So let me ask you a question. If you were attending a crowded, important Christian event, under what circumstances might you give up your seat and to whom? Here's a few possibilities. You might give it up to an elderly person and a walker. So they may be able to see better and possibly be a little bit safer. Or you might give it up to Jumba because of his hearing aid. So he could hear the message much better and clearer. Another may give up the seat to a photographer so he or she can get closer and clear shots. Moving on. Verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thou sin be forgiven thee. Main thing, 
surprising statement. Verse 5a says, when Jesus saw their faith. The reason given for what Jesus said in response is their faith. The plural there is important since this includes the faith of the friend rather than that of the afflicted man. Seeing the great length these men went to, Jesus realized that they believed he had the power to heal their friend. Note, Christians should always be seeking ways to do better at developing the kind of faith that others can see. Verse 5b says, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thou sin be forgiven thee. What Jesus had to say in reaction to this extraordinary entrance surprised us. Wouldn't he, wouldn't we have expected Jesus to say something like, Son, be healed? Instead, what Jesus said got at the heart of the most people's assumption about illness. True or false, the Old Testament frequently assumed a direct connection between sin and sickness. That's true. God's forgiveness is often required for physical healing, and healing us is often the evidence of forgiveness. This belief persisted into Jesus' own day. It's what led the disciples to ask regarding a blind man, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's found in John 9, 2. Moving on, the sequence of events suggests that Jesus treat the paralysis as being the result of a spiritual affliction. Every issue of humanity, physical frailty, can be traced in a general sense to sin of Adam and Eve. But that doesn't mean every specific illness is traceable to a specific sin or person. Question, what did Jesus recognize about this man? Answer, regardless of why the man was paralyzed, Jesus recognized that the man's greater need was to be forgiven for his sin. Verse 6 says, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their heart. Main theme, silent skepticism. Verse 6a says, But there were certain of these of the scribe sitting there. Question, what type of education did the scribes have? They were educated both in God's written law and its oral interpretation. By proportion, Marx mentioned them to be most frequently of the four gospels, but only one time is one of them depicted in other than a negative light. Wow. Sitting was often a posture of teaching, which suggests that these scribes were anticipating more of a debate with Jesus than being taught by Jesus. Verses 6b through 7 says, And reason in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemy, blasphemies? Who can forgive sin? but God only. Mark does not describe the reaction of the paralyzed man, his friend, or the larger crowd to Jesus' surprising statement, but only the unspoken skepticism of the scribes. Priests could offer sacrifices for forgiveness on behalf of those who took the proper steps of repentance. The scribes were well aware that the Old Testament taught that no one can forgive sin but God only. That's in Exodus 34, 6 through 9. But Jesus spoke as though he had the same power to forgive sin as God. 
There's a reason for that. So listen. If the scholars even considered whether Jesus would be God, they would have rejected the idea out of hand. There was no precedent for God becoming man. No. The scribes were therefore left to conclude that Jesus was speaking blasphemies. They viewed Jesus with something to forgive sin as an arrogant offense to the authority and majesty of God. The law of Moses pronounced the penalty for blasphemy to be death by stoning. No. That will indeed be attempted later, but not on this occasion. Listen to this. It's called a reformed cynic. Every Bible professor has to deal with the occasion student who knows it all. One such student, let's call him Jim, started the semester with a perpetual smirk on his face. His body language let his classmates know that whatever I said was already old stuff to him. If Jim disagreed with me, he would look around with that smirk. I don't know what eventually shattered his sense of pride, but Jim changed during that semester. By the end of school, by the end of the school year, he had accepted a ministry position in a community where many citizens were cynical about the Christian faith. Jim seemed to know what drove their cynicism. He was able to counter that attitude, and the church began to grow. The cynics in Jesus' audience were not alls. Unlike Jim, they persisted in refusing to learn, even when the Messiah was their teacher. Question, who are you more like? The skeptics in the text who never learned, or Jim who grew in humility? Just pine on that. Verse seven to eight. Verse eight says, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? The main theme, deceptive judgment. Verse 8, 8 says, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his heart that they reasoned within themselves. We can be confident that Jesus' judgment here went beyond merely reading the body language of the skeptics. Scripture clearly affirmed God's ability to know people's heart. And you can find that in Jeremiah 17, 10. Verse 8b and 9 says, He said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thou send thee forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? Question How did Jesus handle the, 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 the scribes' unspoken disapproval? He did so with a question of his own. Smart. So listen, the use of counter question was common in rabbinic debate and employed frequently by Jesus. Here, Jesus counted question challenged the skeptic belief that Jesus had offered a man something that wasn't in his power to give. And it paved the way for Jesus' upcoming declaration of physical healing. It is easier to declare forgiveness than to tell a paralyzed man to walk. Since the former can't be objectively verified, and the latter has physical proof, but the declaration of forgiveness is more essential and difficult. Listen, 
Most likely, Jesus was emphasizing that both declarations are impossible for human being and easy for God. Verses 10 and 11. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He says to the sick of the palsy. Verse 11. I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. Main theme, absolute authority. Question. So what is Jesus saying in this verse? In this climactic pronouncement, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. This rather mysterious title seemed to have its origin in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 which state that God will restore on man let me go back which state that God will restore on this heavenly figure dominion and glory in the end of time. Son of Man was a favorite self-designation Jesus used. The phrase occurred 80 times in the gospel, and only one occasion, and only on one occasion, the lips of anyone other than Jesus. The amb ambiguity of the title spared, is, spared it from preconceived idea in Jesus' day. Therefore, he was able to infuse it with his own definition. In the gospel, a messianic title is connected with the nature of Jesus, person and work, who he and what he does. In addition to having authority to forgive sin, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That's found in Mark 2, 28. Who came to give his life as a ransom and rise from the dead. He is the one who will one day come in the cloud with great power and glory. True or false, Jesus was able and willing to show the scribes and everyone else that he had power on earth to forgive sin. True, although there is a technical distinction between power Power is the ability to do something. And authority. Authority is the right to do something. Mark doesn't make a sharp distinction. Jesus had both. And that is the crux of this story. His ability to heal physically was tangibly, was tangible proof of ability to heal spiritually by forgiving sin. After Jesus addressed the scribes, in particular, and perhaps the crowd in general, he shifted focus to the paralyzed man. So listen, if the man could obey Jesus' command to, to rise, it would be evident that Jesus was capable of miraculous healing. The man's obedience would also imply that Jesus' earlier pronouncement of forgiveness was as, as effective as his pronouncement of healing. Verse 12, and the last, says, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Main theme, glorify God. Verse 12a says, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all. Question. How can this event be explained in another way? To put it simply, the man believed and obeyed. As there could be no evidence of the man's forgiveness without healing, there could be no evidence of his, there could be no evidence of his faith without 
his obedience. The bed was likely rolled and carried. Verse B, verse 12b says, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. Mark speaks of people is amazed several times in his gospel to describe reacting to what Jesus said with authority and or did as miraculous. The evidence Jesus offered affirmed that his declaration of forgiveness was legitimate. This event was startling evidence that the kingdom of God was indeed at hand. We might think Mark's statement that all glorified God is overstated. Surely the scribes weren't included, but they had to acknowledge the miracle. Whether or not they believed that forgiveness had also been granted. No. For them to glorify God wouldn't necessarily mean that they thank God for sending Jesus. They alone with everyone else simply had never seen events this fashion. Let's try to wrap this up and see what we get from it. It's called a different diagnosis. Today's lesson reminds us of the spiritual component involved in genuine and integrated health and healing. Whether Jesus diagnosed this man's paralysis as being a result of sin, the man certainly couldn't be made whole without spiritual healing. No significant and permanent healing can occur apart from reconciliation with God. As we have seen, God all God alone forgives sin. And God alone is the source of healing. Jesus still has the power and authority to provide healing by bringing relief from the crippling burdens of sin. As God in the flesh, Jesus Christ was the incarnation of the profound statement recorded in Exodus 15, 26. I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is not always seen in physical healing for my ladies in the current life on earth, but it will absolutely be seen in the resurrection bodies that grow from the seed of our present bodies. And you can find that in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 54. So listen, the story also reminds us of how much we need our fellow brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Although we probably won't need them to carry us on a stretcher to church or prayer meeting, we do need to bear one another's burden. And there are times when we need to heed and practice the instruction of James 5, 16, which says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Suggestions. As you reflect on today's lesson and consider how it applies to your life, write a prayer that brings before the Lord your various needs. Lay out your physical, spiritual, emotional, relational, and material needs and your question about them. Call on the absolute authority of Jesus Christ to make you whole so that you can better glorify, honor, and serve him. That concludes our lesson today. Now, this time, if you've heard the lesson and God has pricked your heart and you would like to be saved, I would like to extend the invitation to discipleship. And that simply says, and I read from the Bible, it's Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. And it says that if you shall confess 
with you, with the Lord Jesus, with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and should believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Verse 10 says, And for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. I pray that I've done what you had asked. I pray that this word, this lesson has touched someone's heart. We pray that you bless First Baptist Church. Lord, we pray that you bless America. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.